Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word <clears throat> through the technique of rebound. I'm going to ask Brian to pray for us. He'll give us about 15 seconds or so to prepare. He'll close out our prayer time. We'll move right on into our study. Give him about 15 seconds, Brian. <clears throat> Father, we have uh, a lot to be thankful for to come to the uh, beginning of the week and uh, study the word and a lot, lot going on in the world around us. Uh, and just if you can just take a look at what's happening and uh, the truth and looking into the truth and understanding the backdrop of the angelic conflict and, and, and looking at just uh, how how the times we're living in, Father, that we need need to lean on the promises, the mm. principles, the doctrines, the techniques, and the rules for living. And uh, it's just refreshing to come on Monday and uh, and just dive into the Word of God. And with a so I hope everybody's prepared <laughs> and uh, is open to learn and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us tonight. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, John. And we'll have uh, Cody Humphrey be coming in here with us in just a few minutes. He'll be sitting over here to the side. And uh, Brian, before we begin, we're going to study tonight uh, Ephesians 4, 4, part 21, and uh, we'll be in verse uh, 18. Actually, it's uh, 18. I, I think I just misprinted. That's 18 rather than 21. Yeah. And uh, we've got a, lot to, got a lot to say, but before we begin, uh, many people may, may not know you coming from outside here. Uh, this is my son, Brian Bertell. He was born in Trinidad while I was in the Navy. Uh, he tell, what, What's your business? Tell them what your business is. Well, uh, right now, I'm currently working from the house remotely, and we sell uh, sanitation trailers and ADA trailers and shower trailers to the military and to just about every industry group Okay, uh, that you can imagine. So we uh, we represent seven manufacturers so okay do you uh, have a you have a website yeah yeah What's it's, it uh, it's luxury lab lav uh -huh. uh lady apple violin .com. okay excellent mm -hmm. okay well good to have you with us tonight yep. for the first time son and we're going to go to our notes and uh we're going to talk about ephesians 4 18 but it sort of leads up to that by uh a translation we've exposited uh this verse uh 18 so give us a reading of that thing where we're going with that Okay, uh, having become darkened in their way of thinking, having been estranged, estranged, alienated, excluded from the life of their God because of their ignorance, which keeps them on being in them because of the hardness of their heart, scar tissue mm -hmm. in the subconscious mind located in the right lobe of the soul's mentality. See, and that's where we're coming from. We, we know that Paul's been talking to a group of born again believers who grew up in a, in a reversionistic, unbelieving society. They've mm -hmm. taken on all that false information, living with human viewpoint. Now they become a born again Christian. They believe the gospel and Paul is challenging them to get off that road to reversionism. Now, interestingly, after having finished this uh, session yesterday, we got to the point where we had run through the verse, but we had some extra things we need to talk about. And what we're gonna do is start with Isaiah's commission and we're going to go back into the Old Testament in many passages of Scripture to read where God was actually dealing with the Jews who were under the law, but they were living a, a, a they were living a a legalistic life, yeah, a reversionistic life. And uh, Paul, uh, I mean Isaiah, has been commissioned by God to go out there mm -hmm. and preach the gospel to these people. And the interesting thing is, when we see what he's saying to them, we're going to look at our country just like you prayed. And good grief, you'd think we were talking about Israel. Mm -hmm. So why don't you start there, son, and read through this verse. And uh, there's some bracketed information here that explains what it is we're talking about. So go ahead and read that for us. Okay. Uh, then I, 
Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Mm -hmm. Then I, Isaiah said, here I am, send me. He said, go and tell the people, you keep on listening, but you do not perceive you keep on looking, but you do not understand Isaiah rendered rendered the hearts of this people insensitive mm -hmm. their ears dull stupid insensitive insensible yeah. and their eyes dim unfit to devote time to the truth otherwise they might see with their eyes hear with their ears understand with their hearts and return and be healed which is restored recovered and pardoned Excellent. now watch this Isaiah is being commissioned by God. <laughs> he says, look, I need somebody to go with, me, uh, go, go preach to these people. Who's going to go? He said, okay, Lord, send me. Now watch here. He says, here I am, send me. And God is telling Isaiah, go tell this people. Now watch what he's going to tell them. Isaiah is going to, is going to uh, talk to the people of Israel. And if, if we brought this down to a contemporary time right now, mm -hmm. it would be like you or me mm -hmm. saying to the people out there, <laughs> here's what he says, go tell the people, keep on listening. I'm saying to you, keep on listening, but you don't perceive. Mm -hmm. Then he goes on and says, you keep on looking, but you don't understand. Mm -hmm. He said, now what? Isaiah is going to teach them, and God's telling him, render the hearts of the people insensitive. Now, when we read that, it sounds to me like that God just saying, okay, hey, just go out and zap them, okay? Mm -hmm. Here's the issue, though. God has decreed since eternity past a consequence for failure to be positive toward the Word of God. And the consequence of negative volition is a hardened heart, mm -hmm. a heart that becomes the, the mind, it becomes insensitive. Their ears become dull, they're stupid, they're insensitive. Mm -hmm. And what happens, their eyes dim. Now, the, their eyes dimming here, this is the eyes of the heart, okay? Mm -hmm. They become dim. You don't see, you don't see the truth, you don't divide your devote your time to the truth. And he says, look. If you did go out there and teach them, otherwise, he says, they might see with their eyes and hear with their heart or with their ears. That almost sounds to me like God says, wait a minute. Otherwise, they might see whether he's like saying, don't don't do this because if they do, they're going to see, they're going to hear, they're mm -hmm. going to understand. And guess what? They'll return and be healed. He's not being negative about that. He's simply telling mm -hmm. them, when you go out and teach, this is what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now in verse nine, going back to verse nine, he said, go and tell those people. Let's take a look at this verse and let's pull that apart for a minute. And we got four, four points here. Just begin to, to read this about Isaiah's commission. We're going to take a look at two words. He said, now mm -hmm. with that in mind, what's going to happen with that phrase he said? In in Isaiah in verse nine, Isaiah's commission, consider the phrase he said. Mm -hmm. The expression which follow he said mm -hmm. will denote hardness of the heart and blindness of the mind. Now see what's happened here. He's he's gonna, he said. Now what's going to happen after that? God's going to tell uh, tell uh, Isaiah there's some things that are going to happen here. And I want you to realize what's going to happen after you go out there and teach these people. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, all these words are going to mean their hearts have been hardened and their their minds are blinded. I want us to think not only of Israel. Mm -hmm. I want you to think about what's going on in our country today, what's mm -hmm. going on in the streets all over this country. Mm -hmm. Point number one, Brian. The Jews would hear the words of Isaiah, but they would not understand him. See, and this is what's happening today. Much preaching mm -hmm. is being heard, but, but many people are not understanding it. It's a good example. Point number two. They were so fixated on committing sin that they would neither believe nor regard Isaiah the prophet. So what's happening, he's going out and preaching just like God wanted him to do. But these people were so fixated on their sins, their mental, their verbal, their mm -hmm. overt sins, all this stuff that they're involved in out there, but they're not getting the picture, okay? Mm -hmm. So please, I want us to understand something here. Is that like keeping the law? Oh, yes. Just, just, they were so fixated yeah. on keeping the law. They were keeping the law, but mm -hmm. they weren't recognizing mm -hmm. they should be seeing mm -hmm. Jesus in all that. Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Please, 
understand this, point two gives us a clue regarding the attitude with which pastors must deliver God's message. Okay, now watch this. They're so fixated on committing sin mm -hmm. that they're not going to believe or regard what the prophet's saying. So what I want us to do here is to, this is going to give us a clue as to the attitude of the pastor mm -hmm. that's going to deliver the message. For example, mm -hmm. if we knew that everybody online with us here on, on WebEx, if we looked at the people on Facebook right now and we knew that everybody that's online with it is not going to hear, they're not going to listen, what's our attitude? We might say, heck, why don't we just go fishing or something yeah, like that? Come on in, Cody. Yeah. Why don't we just give it up? That's right. See, why not just yeah. give up? Get your seat over here and just uh, get over here where you can see us, okay? So, so here's the issue. Why not just give up? Mm -hmm. But what we want to understand is if you're going to go out and preach, if I'm going to go out and preach and teach the Word of God, we know the people are not going to listen. Guess what? Instead of giving up, we need to understand what the pastor's attitude mm -hmm. ought to be, and that's going to be right there in point number four. What is it? Yeah, point four, the pastor's proper attitude. Yeah. A pastor is obligated to deliver God's message, even though his message will neither be understood nor believed. So if you and I are going to go out and teach, and that's, you know, even true, uh, if you and Cody are going out here, uh, Cody's on the job, you're out there on the mm -hmm. job, you're meeting people everywhere, mm -hmm. there's an opportunity to share the word of God, you share it, but you say, well, I know they're not going to listen to me, they're not going to believe it, so why don't I just keep my mouth shut? No, the issue is, the attitude is an obligation to deliver the word of God to the people out here so that they'll be given a chance. Wouldn't I don't want anybody to get the Bema seat or the great white throne and accuse me of not telling them the truth because mm -hmm. I didn't, I misread them, see? Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. So we need to know that Isaiah is going to have the proper attitude. He's going out and deliver this message, even though they may not listen to him. So from this, what we've just said here, we've got two words of wisdom for pastors right. and wisdom mm -hmm. number one. Right there. Truth often irritates people. Just stop and think about that. Mm -hmm. Truth often irritates people. Mm -hmm. They don't want it. They want to listen to it. I, I, uh, I just within the last two days, I was talking to somebody and they said, listen, every time I every time I try to talk to a person who has a lot of problems, they say, I don't want to hear. It. I don't want to hear. It. Get away from me. Get away from me. I don't want to listen to this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So truth number one, or number one, is that truth often irritates people. Just realize that, folks. We have an obligation, but it may irritate people. Number two. Yeah. Nevertheless, truth must be proclaimed. So just because people yeah. are going to be irritated doesn't mean you keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You give kindly and in love, you just go ahead and give it. Now, in verse 10 of this same passage, in Isaiah's commission, mm -hmm. God's going to tell Isaiah something. What's he going to tell him right here? In Isaiah's commission, God tells Isaiah to go and proclaim the truth, knowing that the truth <laughs> will irritate, provoke, which is cause them to complain yeah. and in, and enrage the people who will hear this message. See, we're going to see we're going to see example after example of this. Yeah. Isaiah's going to go out and teach. Mm -hmm. That's what God wanted him to do. But he knows that when he goes and does this, the people are going to be irritated. We saw the Jews, they, they wanted yeah. to kill Moses. Look what they, look what they yeah. did to Paul. So the, the, the truth is going to irritate people. We simply need to understand that. There are going to be people out there that accept it. But this word provoke here, knowing that the truth will irritate, provoke, that's the word that we're talking about, meribah. Yeah. We've used this word uh, for years, talking about meribahing, meribahing, meribahing. Well, the Jews had a situation in a place called Meribah. It's a location in a place called Rephidim where they were looking for water, didn't have any. And all they did was complain. They griped here, griped there, griped there. That's what that word provoke means. Mm -hmm. They were caused to complain. And then while they're irritated because they're hearing the truth, they complained about it and their message, the Isaiah's message was enraging the people. Mm. Now, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10, that's our verse. Read, go ahead and read that whole verse there. Isaiah 6, 10. Go and pro proclaim the truth <laughs> to a corrupt people, and the result will be that they will not hear. Yeah. They are so wicked that they will not give heed to it. They will become even more hardened, yet go, and, the, <laughs> and, and though it is certain to produce these effects, go proclaim it. 
Isn't that amazing? Yeah, just go proclaim it. Go teach it. That's exactly right. He's no matter, go ahead. No matter what the consequences are. That's exactly go, right. No problem. He's going to go and proclaim the truth. Mm -hmm. And what kind of a people? What kind of people is he going to proclaim it to? What Which is right? wicked, yes. corrupt, corrupt, wicked corrupt people? Yes. Mm -hmm. And God knows that. Mm -hmm. But here again, you, you know that that's an interesting thought. If I came to you and said, you know, there's a certain section of town here that really needs the gospel. Well, they're not going to hear any hear what you have to say. They're not going to believe it. But you know, you really need to go and and tell these people so that they won't have an excuse. And honestly, that Cody, that's a good a good issue for us. The issue is when we know that we're going to teach the truth and somebody isn't going to listen. Listen, they've had an opportunity. They will never be able to have an excuse that I didn't know, I didn't hear. Mm -hmm. So that's why the obligation. So go proclaim the truth to a corrupt people. And he says, the result will be that they will not hear. They are so wicked that they don't give heed to it. They will come, they will come even more hardened. See, they already have mm -hmm. a hardened heart. Yeah. Darkness, black out of the soul. Yet he says, in spite of that, you go. Even though you know it's going to produce these effects, go and proclaim it. Now, what we have is some more verses then throughout the scripture, some of them in the New Testament, in the Gospels, some other places. And it's going to it's going to deal with this idea of a hardened heart. And that was what we were talking about in verse 17, 18. Paul says, look, you're on the road to reversionism. Get off that road. So he's going to tell us something similar to that here in, in the Gospel of Mark. So read. Well, this is just giving them. God's sent him and given them no excuse. So once they hear the truth right here, yeah. there's no excuse. That's, that's exactly it's right. Once they know, you, it's like you don't have any excuse for being uh, ignorant. That's, so, that's exactly right. So Mark 3, 5, what does that say? After looking, Jesus is the one who is looking mm -hmm. around at them, the Pharisees, with anger, righteous indignation, Grieved at their hard, hardness of heart, which is scar tissue of the soul, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. See, this is just another passage where in, in, the, in the ministry of Jesus, mm -hmm. he's out there teaching. And we're going to see, we're going to see some of the things that Jesus did. And as a result of all that, you, mm -hmm. you sort of sh shake your head and say, mm -hmm. I can't believe that they missed, missed this fact it. as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But see, Jesus out there, he's looking around and he's and he's, he's looking at these Pharisees out there. See, these Pharisees are legalistic, religious, unbelieving Jews who think they're on top of things. These are really, really legalistic people. Mm -hmm. They think that everything's okay with them and they're missing the whole boat because all they're doing is seeing uh, Judaism as a, a, a basis for keeping the law while, while missing that Jesus is the Messiah. Messiah. Now, I've indicated that when you take that and make a comparison to Christianity today, while the Jews were missing Jesus as the Messiah, we as born-again Christians, millions of us, are missing the fact that unless you're living the Christian life in the sphere of the Spirit, it's all worthless. Mm -hmm. It's all worthless. Now, the, the sad part about it is the Jews are going to lose their salvation, or not lose their salvation. They won't be saved, mm -hmm. but for us, we lose our blessing in time and reward in eternity. Mm -hmm. So here he is. He said he, he's grieved. Jesus has grieved over the fact that these people have hardened their heart. They're not hearing anything he's saying. Now, how about Mark 6.52? For they, a boatload of Jesus' followers, had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. Now, here's what happened. Yeah. Jesus, these, uh, this boatload of, uh, of Jesus' followers, now hold it. These are people who are following Jesus, mm -hmm. but they're following him. Hey, he, look what, we're hungry. He just fed 5,000 people back here. Let's get in on this thing, okay? So they're following him, and he says, okay, uh, I got something to do here. You get in that boat, and you go to the other side. I'll meet you over there. So they had not gained insight into the incident of loaf of bread. What had happened? We'll see that here in this next, next issue. Because they had seen something happen out there, they didn't realize this is really Jesus the Messiah. These are Jews that are following him, trying to figure out what life is all about. He sends them to the other side of the, the shore, and he says their heart 
was hardened. What do we mean by that? Look at this. Look at the incident. What is this incident of the loaves? They didn't get it. What is it? It is feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Oh, yeah. And they saw this happen. That was in the Gospel of John. So in one place, he feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. They still not get in the picture. He sends them to the other side. And he says, look at this. Man, I can't believe that they're not getting this. Okay. Then also, there was another incident in the book of Matthew. What did he do? Feeding 4,000 people with seven loaves and two fish. Same thing. These guys see this happen and they're not getting it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why? Their heart had been hardened. They were saying, no, 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 mm -hmm. no, no. Every time you say no, your heart is being hardened. Mm -hmm. You're going to say it enough and no, there's nothing coming in. So, this hardening of heart, what is it? Yeah, right oh, here. The hardening of the heart mentioned by Jesus is an expression of their rejecting him as their Messiah at the first advent. See, that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. See, they're, they're, they're rejecting this idea. What about this five loaves? No, that, uh, the, the 5,000. No, we didn't, we didn't get it. And that's an expression of rejecting him as their, as their Messiah at the first advent. So the only thing left to do is just they harden their heart. God says, okay, you keep doing this, keep doing it. You're just going to harden your heart. You're not going to hear anything. Okay, John 12, 40 says what? He, God the Father, operating through his divine laws, has blinded, that's black out of the soul, there, which is reversionistic unbelievers of Israel, eyes, which is the eyes of their soul, and he, God the Father, hardened, which is calloused and scarred, mm -hmm. their heart, which is subconscious mind, in the right lobe, mm -hmm. so for the purpose that they would not see, which see means perceive with their eyes, the eyes of their heart, and perceive, understand with, by means, their heart, which is the right lobe of their soul's mentality, and, and be converted, receive conversion, and I, mm -hmm. God the Father, heal, recovery from reversionism, them, which is reversionistic unbelievers Absolutely. of Israel. Absolutely. Now let's go back here again. So what happened is that, that God says here, he has blind, now watch this, he has blinded mm -hmm. their eyes. You know, that that's sort of Cody sitting over there and I, I said, okay, uh, guess what? And I pick up a laser beam, say, mm -hmm. and I shoot this laser beam right into his eyes. I have caused him to become blind, okay? Mm -hmm. That's not what God did. What we need to understand is how did he go about that? We know that we're living in a spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. The decrees of God have been written since eternity past before he even created angels, before he created anything. So God's plan was already in place for all of, for all of human history, eternity future. Now what happens is man is being born then, and, and after Adam was created, we're born with an old sin nature in every cell of our body. Now, the question in the angelic conflict, are you going to be positive toward the plan of God or are you going to be negative toward the plan of God? So when you're negative toward the plan of, plan of God, guess what? He has blinded, black out, black out of the soul, he has blinded their eyes. Well, he, he didn't shoot a laser beam into them. What he did is in eternity past, he said, okay, positive lesion, hey, you're going to have light. It, you'll see everything that's out there. If you don't, if you're negative toward that, guess mm -hmm. what? The consequence of negative volition is that your heart will, your eyes will be blinded. You'll have black out of the soul. God didn't cause it. He allowed it to happen because you violated his decrees. So mm -hmm. when you read that, he has blinded their eyes. Someone might say, that. what kind of a God is that? That he blinded these people's eyes. They need to be able to see and he blinded them. No, they did it to themselves. Because this is the plan in the angelic conflict. And this is why I say time and time again, Cody and Brian, this, the, unless you understand the angelic conflict, how in the world could you accept the fact that God is out there blinding the eyes of anybody? You, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he hardened their heart. See, the mm -hmm. same way. How did he harden their heart? The plan is, if you violate the plan of God, you do this to yourself. He hardened their heart. And what was that? So that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their, with their heart 
And what are they going to perceive? They're going to perceive the gospel, be saved, and be converted. Mm -hmm. The Messianic Jew. Yeah, and he and he would heal them in the sense that mm -hmm. he's going to heal them from their reversionic reversionistic mm -hmm. lifestyle. Mm -hmm. It's not heal them physically. He's healing them spiritually. Why? Because they were turned on to the Word of God. They did the right thing in the right way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now let's summarize that verse twelve forty. Point number one with a couple of bullet points. Go ahead, pal. Okay. The Jews in the time of our Christ's earthly ministry followed the same pattern as the Pharaoh of Exodus. Okay, now watch this. So what we're doing now is we're going to go back in the Old Testament mm -hmm. and see the Pharaoh mm -hmm. in Egypt. And they were the Jews were un, under uh, under the slavery, <laughs> slaving hand of the Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. Okay, they were down there for 400 years. God says, okay, Moses, I want you to get down there and liberate these people. So Moses goes down. And he says, uh, excuse me, Pharaoh, mm -hmm. uh, God told me to let my people go. Let his people go. Pharaoh says, why don't you take a flying leap? Get out of here. I'm not going to do that. Well, that's negative relation toward God. Now, what happens when we understand the fact that this is what, this is what the Pharaoh was doing, he was negative toward God's plan. Guess what? We take a look now and see the Jews are doing exactly the same thing. They're following the same path that Pharaoh did. They are negative toward plan of God for their lives. So read the point number one and give, a, give us a couple of bullet points there. Okay. Uh, the Jews in the time of Christ's earthly ministry followed the same yeah. pattern as the Pharaohs, the Pharaoh of Exodus, negative volition towards God. Yes. The, fa the Pharaoh was negative towards God. The Jews during Jesus' earthly ministry were negative towards him. Okay. See, it's the same pattern. Now, what we're doing, we're getting a great big picture of what, of what it was like when Paul's coming along now. And we're in, we're in Ephesians, mm -hmm. and Paul is talking to a group of reversionistic believers about having grown up in a, in a negative, uh, unbelieving, reversionistic society, society and telling them, this is where you get all this. Now, you need to understand, I'm giving you some information to get off that road and go the right way. But mm -hmm. the question, are you going to do the same thing the Pharaoh did? Are you going to do mm -hmm. what everybody else is doing? No, that's not what we need to do. So point number two, we're going to see another verse then, and we're talking about this idea of the Pharaoh saying no in Exodus 10, 28. 10, 28, what do you say? Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Beware. Do not see my face again, for in the days you see my face, you shall die. See, this is negative volition. Yeah. Negative volition toward God. Mm -hmm. He said, look, get away from me. The Jews are saying the same thing to Jesus about uh, Paul comes along and he's teaching them the grace gospel. He said, get away from me. We don't want to hear any more of that. We find that Paul, before he became a Messianic Jew, he was killing people who were saying Jesus is the Messiah. That's negative volition. And what I guess what we're wanting to see here is to try to recognize something about what negative volition is. And it's not always going out and, and killing somebody or doing something really severe or horrible out there. Listen, just saying no to God is about as horrible as you can get. Mm -hmm. So don't see my face again from the day you come. If you come back to talk to me about this one more time, you are a dead man. That's mm -hmm. negative volition toward God. He won't let the people go. Exodus 5, 2. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? Mm -hmm. I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. See, so this he, is, he's just saying he's not going to let Israel go. That's right. See, and that, and God wants him to be delivered. He will get him out of here. Mm -hmm. They've been down there for 400 years, mm -hmm. pleading, 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 pleading. And remember, the reason God left them there is because he says the he was he's going to take them out of Egypt, going to bring them through the through the uh, through the desert, and get them into get them into Canaan, get them into the promised land that he promised them. He so he brings them he brings them out of Egypt. Good grief! They get to the Red Sea and they find out they can't get across there. They think they're going to die. God opens up the Red Sea, takes them into the takes them into the desert. Now we don't have, the water's bitter, there's not enough water, that kind of thing. What are they going to do? They're going to complain, 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 complain. That's where we're going to see this idea of marabying, okay? Mm -hmm. So he's, and Pharaoh says again, 
Who's the Lord that I should obey him? Hey, what are you got to be kidding me? Mm -hmm. And he's telling me to let the people go. He says, I don't know who your Lord is, and I will not let him go. Again, negative lesion. Now, what are we doing? We're showing the pattern of Pharaoh is going to be enacted out here by the people that are alive in Jesus' generation when he comes on the scene, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, let's, con let's consider this next point. Now consider the miracles of Jesus that should have called Jewish attention to the fact that Jesus is their Messiah, but the light did not turn on. So what's going to happen now, what we're doing is we're, we've come away from the Pharaoh. We've seen the negative evolution there. We've seen now that the pattern of the Jews in Jesus' day when he was in his public ministry, these Jews are reacting the same way mm -hmm. Pharaoh did, okay? Now what happens is, we're going to see something that Jesus did, and if I don't know if you were if you were alive at the time Jesus was in his public ministry, I don't know what how we how you'd react or I I just say look when I see this, he says I am the Messiah, and he heals somebody. He says I am the mm -hmm. Messiah. He raises somebody from the dead. He said I am the Messiah, and he unstops somebody's deaf ears. He says I am the Messiah. He stops. He opens up somebody's eyes that's blind. I say, wait a minute. I think I'm getting them, Lord. Mm -hmm. You must be the Messiah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now watch what happened. We're going to consider then some of the miracles that Jesus is going to use. Just read that whole point one more yeah. time. Uh, four. Point number four. Okay. Yeah. Now consider the miracles of Jesus that should have called. Jewish attention to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, read this next point, and then we're going to give some miracles. Go ahead. Okay. According to the four Gospels, Mark, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, here are the miracles Jesus performed during his time on earth. Mm -hmm. For the most part, Christians know that Jesus performed many miracles, but may be surprised to learn of some of which we didn't know. That's right. So what we're going to do now is talk about and we're going to mention a, a bunch of miracles. So if you were living in that point in time and you're right. following Jesus, there are several clues here that should <laughs> say to you, wait a minute, this is the Messiah. Right. And we're going to find out that 40 years later, he's going to drive, God's going to drive Israel out of the land because they had rejected right down to the end to where he couldn't, let, he couldn't take it anymore. Get out of here. And that's why we're here preaching because Israel failed. Now let's see some of these some of these uh, miracles then, and uh, Brian's just, Brian's just going to read the list, but we're not going to read the verses. You can see those, and you can read them if you want to after. We want to move through this to show the miracles that Jesus performed during his three years of public ministry that ought to given somebody a clue of who he was. Okay. Go ahead and start Reba. Okay, uh, number one, uh, Jesus changed water into wine. Jesus cured the nobleman's son, the great hall of fishes, Jesus cast out unclean spirit. Yeah. Jesus cured Peter's mother-in-law of fever. Jesus healed the leper. Uh, Jesus healed the centurion ser servant. Jesus raised the widow's son from the dead. Jesus stilled the storm. Jesus cured two demoniacs. demoniacs. These are people. These are people who are demon, demon possessed. possessed. Yeah, sure. Uh, Jesus cured uh, the paralytic. Mm -hmm. Jesus raised the ruler's daughter from the dead. Mm -hmm. Jesus cured a woman of an issue of blood. Mm -hmm. Jesus opened the eyes of two blind men. Jesus loosened the tongue of a man who couldn't speak. Jesus healed an invalid man. It's an, in an invalid. An, an invalid. Mm -hmm. Okay, invalid man mm -hmm. at the pool caught called Bethesda, Jesus restored a withered hand, Jesus cured a <laughs> demon-possessed man, Jesus fed at least 5,000 people, Jesus healed a, women, the, a, a woman of Canaan, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus cured a deaf and mute man, mm -hmm. Jesus fed at least 4,000 people, Jesus opened the eyes of a blind man, Jesus cured a boy who was plagued with a demon, Jesus opened the eyes of a man born blind. Jesus cured a woman, a woman who had been afflicted 18 years. Jesus cured a man of dropsy. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus cleansed 10 leopards. Uh, Jesus raised, raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus opened the eyes of two blind men. Jesus caused the fig tree to wither. Jesus restored the ear of the high priest servant, 
Jesus rose from the dead. The the second great hall of fishes. That's 40, that's 34, 34, 34 miracles. miracles. And that's why he's in three years' time. He's in his public ministry, walking around, and these the people everywhere are rejecting it, rejecting it, rejecting it, rejecting it. By the time you get to Pentecost 30 AD, he's got a room full of people. That's all that's left. It's amazing. But now, after you have just read 34 miracles that he performed during those three years, what we find is that's not all that he did. So yeah. let's find out what else he did that isn't even written down. John 21, 25 is a fantastic passage of scripture. Let's look at that. And, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the book that would be written. That's scripture. Yeah. 34 miracles through here, they're written about it. He said, look, the world, the world isn't big enough to contain the books that all these things that he'd done would be written. So in spite of such overwhelming evidence, what about it? In spite of such overwhelming evidence, which is divine miracles and dynamic messages from Jesus, the Jews in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry continued to say no and enter into the stages of reversionism. See, that's exactly what happened. They said, no, 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 mm -hmm. no. And what's happening today? We find Same that no, 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 no. It's amazing. Uh, there was, a, uh, there was a, um, a panel of Hispanics, Latinos, meeting with a, with a president just a little while ago. And one of the ladies that spoke uh, is a teacher. And she was talking about, she was absolutely fantastic, talking about the, the education system in our country, which is what I've been trying to tell people about for such a long time. One of the failures in this country is not just the pulpit, our public school system and our colleges are failing because they're actually brainwashing our kids with progressive kind of information, Marxist kind of information. And our people are just sitting back here like, oh, we don't really know what's going on. I've got this wonderful child that's out in college, but we don't have a yeah. clue as to what they're learning. Yeah. And when they come out, the next thing you know, they're out there, there was an 18 year old that was uh, that was a part of a group here in on television yesterday. It was They arrested four of them. She was a college, all four of these kids came from high class parents mm -hmm. and they were out there burning the buildings and calling for the, for the death of policemen, et cetera. Where are they getting all this? They're saying, no, 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 no. We've seen the same thing we're talking about here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the overwhelming evidence, divine miracles. We just saw 34 of them. Mm -hmm. Now, in point number five, what else about negative volition? Ne uh, negative volition opened the vacuum in the left lobe of their soul's mentality, and they progressively moved through the first five stages of reversionism and then moved into the sixth stage, blackout of the soul, resulting in the saturation of their soul with sa satanic false doctrine. So what happens is this, no matter who you are, no matter who you are, if you're negative toward the plan of God, you're in the battle. We know that. What battle are we in? Angelic conflict. When did you get in it? From the time I was born. From the time you're born. So the question is, are you going to be positive uh, at the point of God consciousness? Are you going to be positive at the point of gospel hearing? And if you are, now that you're born again, it's not sitting around waiting for Jesus to come back or to die. Mm -hmm. It's getting involved in the ministry of resolving this angelic conflict. Now, what happened here is when you are negative, we've talked about eight state eight stages of reversionism. You start out with a reactor and a reaction and distraction. Mm -hmm. Then you move into frantic search for happiness. Mm -hmm. Then you move into Operation Boomerang. Then you move into emotional revolt of the soul. That's the first four stages. And what we saw, if you remember, I think it was like yeah. yesterday, mm -hmm. we saw the progression of darkness in the soul. Yeah. You start out with no darkness when you're born. But now as, you, as, a, as an unbeliever, as an old sin nature, following your trend toward asceticism or lasciviousness, you're taking in all this information from the culture, from the society around you, until you get 
enough of the word of God to understand there's something else out here. So you're filling your mind with all this information. Now, if you're an unbeliever and you keep going in that direction, you're going to begin to see that you're reacting to the plan of God. You're reacting to the circumstances of life. You're distracted from the plan of God, which means nothing's working. So God tried to get your attention. It didn't work. So you move on to the frantic search for happiness. Now it's all these things. It's money. It's sports. Mm -hmm. It's this. It's that. It's something else. That doesn't work. And you get banged in the head with Operation Boomerang. It just it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then you you move on into emotional revolt of soul. Well, I just go with it, everything that makes me feel good. Well, that doesn't work either. So now what happens? You enter negative, permanent negative volition. Now the 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 uh, the vacuum, Matiotes. God tells us this is what happens in the left lobe of the mentality. It's like having a vacuum cleaner up here, Cody. Yeah. And that vacuum code, you come along, you give me some false viewpoint. Whoop, my sucks it in. Somebody else comes along, gives you something false, sucks it in. You go to a class at high school, you go to college, you just giving you all this information, the vacuum's in her, <laughs> sucking it all in. So that you now have a darkened soul, black out of the soul. And because you don't stop there, you, you're, you're actually, you're permanently negative now. So your whole soul becomes black. And then all of a sudden you begin to scar up something, you scar up your soul. That's the next stage. You couldn't get anything out if you wanted to. All you can get out there is human viewpoint. Mm -hmm. it, it's so what's happened here. Negative volition opens the vacuum. We're in the left lobe no. of the mentality. Mm -hmm. This is where we indicated the word of God comes into your soul through the ear mm -hmm. gate, eye gate, or tactile. Mm -hmm. And it comes into the frame of reference. Yep. That's the staging platform for everything you're going to believe. There's a state now. Well, the question is, what's it going to do? Is it going back out because you didn't understand? Or is it coming down on the subconscious platform because you believed it, whether it was a liar or whether it was good? Yep. But this vacuum in the soul now is sucking in all this information into the left lobe of mentality. And they progressively moved through the first five stages of reversionism. And guess what? Then they moved into the sixth stage. They're at five, you're ne permanently negative toward doctrine, toward the word of God. Mm -hmm. So now you have a completely blacked out soul, which leads you then into the next stage, which is scar tissue of the soul. And again, here, stage six, black yeah. out of the soul, resulting in what? Saturation of their soul with satanic false doctrine. That's right. Mm -hmm. Satanic doctrine. That's false doctrine. It's the lies of life. Now, in point six, you've reached, you've reached black out of the soul. You are, you are permanently negative toward the word of God. This is where you said, no, 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 no. That's what Pharaoh did. That's what these Jews are doing here in the, in the ministry of Christ. Mm -hmm. This is what the people are doing in our country today. Yep. There's a, there, And that doesn't mean all of We know that there's some people that are positive toward doctrine, aren't mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. uh, but not just here in Maumelle. Across the country, there are people that are positive. But what we need is a pivot of mature believers big enough that when God looks down and says, uh, excuse me, yep, there's enough down there. Let's give them some more grace. We'll extend this grace period. He looks down and says, boy, there's not enough down there. It's not worth it. Bingo. Mm -hmm. Out the country goes. Out the nation goes. He'll protect us. He'll provide for us. May not be what we want, but it's what yeah. he wants for us. Yeah. And so we're going we're gonna to move on then with him. So yeah. in point number six, black out of the soul leads to what? Blackout of the soul leads to scar tissue of the soul, whereby any future sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is completely lost. Can't do it. You can't. You're not going to listen to him. Yeah. You, you toss, can't. You, go ahead. Toss out the agent that that is yeah. that teaches you and that's confirms exactly right. and bears witness with your heart. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. And that's because of negative volition, negative volition, negative volition. So what we need to understand is your children, my children, our children, your grandchildren, your parents, when you look at them, when you look at what's going on, one of the people in that Latino group today, they said, look, it, it was amazing. There, it was a particular man. I didn't know what his name was, didn't catch it, but he was so, so eloquent. And he, he said, listen, we are not dealing with our children. We're not raising our children properly. He said, so the, the, the parents and the, they're failing. 
if the parents fail the kids, the kids are going to fail. There's nothing, nothing can happen. Now, if the kids fail, guess what? They go out and listen here, listen there, listen there. And now what you see is what's going on across this country. And I would suggest to you that when you look and we talk about the state of California, the state of Oregon, the state of uh, the state of Washington, it's on fire. I talked to a cousin last, uh, last night. He's in Chatsworth, California. He talked about what's going on there. I talked uh, to Roby and Angela Harris in Redding, California. They're talking about what's going on there, the smoke. And it's amazing. That's three states. Now you look down and you see Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, and Florida about to get blasted with another hurricane. Do you not understand that God is involved in this? He's not causing it, but negative He's allowing, volition. Allowing it. He's allowing it. That's exactly right. And it's because of negative volition. Now, someone mm -hmm. might say to me, well, are you saying that everybody down there is not a Christian? Are you saying this? No, I'm not. God will provide for them in the midst of taking care of whatever destruction takes place. You got that, Cody? You mm -hmm. understand that? Okay, now, they're, they're totally insensitive. Blackout of the skull. Black out of the soul, your your mind is darkened, is filled with nothing but human viewpoint, no doctrine up there. Believer and unbeliever can reach that point. A believer becomes yeah. carnal, whoop, they just turn away from the word of God, they're in that same place. Lose its sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Now, in point seven, listen to this, Brian. Go ahead. Yeah. No generation of Jews ever said no to more overwhelming evidence than the Jews during Christ's earthly ministry. And there is nothing comparable except to go all the way back to the Pharaoh of the Exodus. So what we're being told here that when you take a look at the generation with Jesus, Jesus was alive mm -hmm. and all of this overwhelming evidence, the miracles, his messages, and you see the depravity of the people in his generation, and you're looking for something to compare it to, he said, you've got to go all the way back to the book of Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. You've got to go all the way back there to find negative lesion comparable to what, they're, what they were in in Jesus' day. Now, when you see that, you compare Pharaoh, you compare Jesus' generation, and you look at this country today of what's going on, and you say, good grief. All the way back to Jesus' day. Never been so bad. Okay? So, so are they are they comparing here, making a comparable to uh, the reversionistic yes. side of this yes. or the overwhelming evidence that he's the Messiah? No, it no, okay. it's it no because of the overwhelming evidence, they should have gotten it. Okay. But they didn't. And so we're comparing the rever the reversionism of Jesus' day right, right. with the reversionism mm -hmm. back there. Mm -hmm. And why why uh, why is the reversionism so tremendous, so voluminous in Jesus' day? Is because of the overwhelming evidence that they missed. Okay. Now, <clears throat> go ahead to point eight. The result of Jewish negativity towards Jesus was blackout of the soul, which is the attack on the mentality's left lobe that led to scar tissue of the soul, and that's the attack on the mentality of the right lobe. See, now that, that's sort of a, um, that's sort of trying to help us to see how this thing is work. The, the Jews of Jesus' day were negative toward him. Call, so I'm calling it Jew, Jewish negativity toward Jesus, okay? All the miracles, all of his messages, no, 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 no. They're rejecting him. A oh, nice guy, but he's not the son of God. He's not the Messiah. So with that result in negativity, guess what? Their, their soul had become darkened. They went through reaction and distraction. They went to right on down for frantic search for happiness, right on down to, mm -hmm. to uh, permanent negative lesion. That's their generation. Permanent negative lesion, which led them to six, the sixth stage, black out of the soul. Mm -hmm. and guess what? Because they were in black out of the soul, they had no, no, no uh, understanding to be able to continue to understand what's going up, on out there. So it led them, it led them because God's disciplining all along the way, the warning discipline, intensified discipline, ultimately to the sin and the death for the individual believer, but for the nation, it's fifth cycle of discipline, you're out of here, mm -hmm. okay? So what happened is we just seeing how this thing works. 
you're negative, 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 black out of the soul. You stay negative. That leads to scar tissue of the soul. And what happens is uh, the, the negativity starts out here in the left lobe of the mentality. You take all that stuff in, send it into the right lobe of the subconscious mind. All that is darkened over here and it becomes scarred up and you can't even get it out. Okay. Point number nine. Blackout of the soul and scar tissue of the soul caused Jesus' generation of Jews to remain unconverted and caused the entire nation of Israel that was already in the fourth cycle of discipline to go into the fifth cycle of discipline that was administered in 70 AD. See, Jesus, Jesus was, uh, was, his ministry began around 30 AD. He's in the ministry for three years. Crucified, dead, buried. Seated at the right hand of God the Father, about 40 years later, 37 years later, 70 AD. They should have gotten it, but they didn't. When Jesus came on the scene, they were already in the fourth cycle of discipline. Mm -hmm. So what happened is a result of their of their negativity toward them, boy, it just it just catapulted them into the fifth cycle of discipline, 70 AD, and he said, You're out of there. And that's why when we saw, for example, the apostle Paul come on the scene in Acts chapter nine. He became a converted mess, a converted Jew to become a messianic yeah, Jew. Yeah. He goes into the into the uh, in the Arabian yeah. desert, stays out there for three years, and during that period of time, he becomes the first born again Christian. He's given by by Jesus. He's given the mystery doctrines of the age of grace. Paul comes out of there and begins to teach that during the transition period from 36 AD to 70 AD. Okay? So what happened here now, they're already in the fourth cycle of discipline. So the question is, at that point in time, could they have turned around the Messiah's on the scene? Yes, they mm -hmm. could have. But they said, no, 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 no. And then Peter went out to the Jews. Paul goes out to the Jews, but specifically to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And in that period of time, they did, Israel didn't turn around. 70 AD says, God said, that's it. That's yeah. it. And he brings in the Roman, the Roman soldiers, bingo, overrun, overrun Jerusalem. They destroy the temple, which is the place where they're, where they're going to worship. No, no more temple. Driven out all over the world. And here we are today. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, let's learn something about the Meribah Revolution. Because all this is negative volition. But we're going to go back all the way back to the time of Pharaoh, Moses in the garden, uh, the Jews coming out of, out of Egypt you know, and crossing the Red Sea, etc. So we're going to go back and take a look at the Meribah resolution, Revolution. And mm -hmm. if you don't know what the mer word Meribah means, right, hang on, we're going to give it to you. Mm -hmm. So where it began, this the Meribah Revolution, where it began, here it is. In Exodus mm -hmm. 17 and following, go ahead and read that passage. The whole Israelite community left the desert of sin, moving from one place to another at the command of the Lord. They camped at Repidim. Repidim, but there was no water there to drink. They complained to Moses and said, give us, the, give us water to drink. Moses answered, why are you complaining? Why are you putting the Lord to the test? But the people were very thirsty and continued to complain to Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Moses prayed earnestly to the Lord and said, what? Okay, now we're going to, that we're going to, he's going to say something else there. We're stopping right there. Okay. Okay, now here's what happened. Let's look at this. The Israelite community left the desert of sin. Now, what they, they, they've, come out of, they've come out of Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land, and they're in this desert called sin. That doesn't mean that that's not personal sin. That's just the name of the, the, the yeah. area where they yeah. were. So they were in the desert of sin, and they moved on from there, and they went to another place after uh, to, at the command of God. God says, okay, leave here and go on over here. So now they camped at Rephidim. That's a place of refreshment. So they're coming there, but when, the, when they got there, there wasn't any water. Now remember, while they were in Egypt, 
and Moses would tell them, let them go, let them go, let them go. They saw 10 miracles down there because all of the plagues that came upon uh, Pharaoh and Egypt in order to impress him, let these people go. Mm -hmm. He said, no. So he zapped them, okay? Mm -hmm. No, he zapped them. No, he zapped them. So these people had already seen 10 miracles while they're down there in Egypt. They come out and he finds, okay, geez, I've had enough. Let them go. So they go and they get to the Red Sea and that Pharaoh's army is behind them, pressing them. Here's the Red Sea. And he says, good grief, you brought us all the way out here after all this time. We were okay alive down there. You brought us out here. Now we're going to die at the Red Sea because we can't get away. He says, no, Moses says, no, wham. He hit, he parts the Red Sea. They walk across the Red Sea. They get to the other side. The water collapses and Pharaoh's army drowns in the water, okay? Mm -hmm. Now they get, they get into the, they get into the desert. He's providing manna. He's providing food for them. And now we get to another place up there. They've seen all this. Now, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. they get to a place and they don't have any water. And he says, Moses. And what, here's the word, complain. complain, 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 complain. So what happened in this place called Meribah, in a locate, located in Rephidim, they're complaining about the, the fact they don't have water. So he said, verse two, they complained to Moses. See mm -hmm. the, the key there, they complained, give us water to drink. Moses looked at him and says, William, why are you complaining? Why are you putting God to the test? What do you mean putting him to the test? Didn't mm -hmm. you see what happened back here and here and here and here? He said, you saw all this. So why are you complaining to God? He said, but the people were very thirsty and continued to complain to Moses. And he said, they said, look, good. We, we, were, we didn't like it down there in Egypt. Now you know what you've done? You brought us out here into this wilderness to kill our children and our livestock with thirst. Yeah. Mm -hmm. complain complain so when you see that word when somebody says are you marabine that just means you're complaining you see all this good stuff these people saw 34 miracles of jesus that we know about they saw many more and more they saw the 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 messages that he gave them and bingo no 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 just complain 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 now we got some more information about that okay point number one the Maribah Revolution is discussed in Psalms 95, 8, where the word provocation means Maribah. Mm -hmm. This word is also used in Hebrews 3, 8, 3, 15, and 4, 7. Okay, and that's the word Maribah. And what does Maribah mean? Means complain. What? Means complain. Now, it's translated provoke in the, in the, in the scripture, okay? But it means to complain. Mm -hmm. Now, we said, we talked about Psalm 95, verse 8, where the word Meribah is used. Read yeah. that for us. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, provocation, complain, 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 <laughs> and then complain some more, yeah. as in the day of Maza, uh -huh. temptation yeah. in the wilderness. So Maza and Meribah are often seen as the same thing. It, it, appears, yeah. it appears as though they're the same place. But in other places, it appears as though they're two different places. But what happened is, at Meribah, on one occasion, they were complaining, complaining, and complaining. Mm -hmm. In this Massa, they were tempted in the wilderness, okay? Mm -hmm. So here's the issue. Do not harden your hearts, because what happened is, because they didn't have the water, they weren't getting what God wanted, They were uh, what they wanted from God. They're complaining, compl and all that complaining is adding to the negative, to their the hardness of their heart, okay? So now in Hebrews 3, 8, we're going to get this same kind of an idea, provoked. Now go ahead from there. Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the reversionistic revolution, as in the day of the trial testing in the wilderness. So what happened while they were in the wilderness, they were being tested because here's the water, here's the water. Here's, yeah. They're going to have to test God, uh, test uh, they're going to have to prove themselves because God's going to take them into the promised land. He's going to take them into Canaan. And guess what? When they get there, they're going to have to battle the people that are in there. Okay. Yeah. So they're going to have to learn to trust God. So he says here, do not, watch this. Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. That's saying God's been, they're, they're provoking God. No, what, what that means is they were complaining against God. Do not harden your hearts as when you were when you were complaining about me. I'm not giving you the water. I'm not giving you what you want, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And he says this provoking, this complaining was took place as in the day of trial testing when you were in the wilderness. You got there, you didn't have water. You got there, there was bitter water. You didn't got there, there wasn't enough water. It was water, water, water. They're complaining. They're complaining about their food. Okay? Lack of faith. That's exactly right. Now, Hebrews 3.15. Hebrews 3.15, while it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And when they provoke me, as when, yes, as, as when rebellion. they provoke me. See, he's going back and talking about that same rebellion. Mm -hmm. They're rebelling against God. What, how are they rebelling? They're complaining, complaining, complaining. Because they're not getting what they want. That's exactly right, Brian. So today, if you hear his voice, and what, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. See, God isn't provoked. Mm -hmm. What that means, they're complaining against God. That's the idea there. How about Hebrews right. 4, 7? He again fixes a certain day. Today, saying through David after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. There you go. Now let's now we just talk, this is the this is the Maribah revolution. So we've we've seen some verses where yeah. the Jews back in the are provoking uh, they're 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 complaining about God. Okay. Now let me point out something. We're talking about yeah. we're see we're talking it's about an modern, application a, to today. A modern day application. That's right. So we see what we see what Pharaoh did. We see what the Jews did. And darn if you don't come into today and find the same thing is happening in this client nation. See that's the thing, Brian yeah. and Cody. The United States of America is a client nation to God. We're doing exactly the same thing. So what are we complaining about? That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look. Let's summarize the Maribal Revolution. Here it is, point number one. The Maribal Revolution is reversionism among believers in Exodus 17, 1 through 4, in contrast to unbeliever, unbeliever reversionism. Now watch this. We've we talked about um I I'm not sure we've talked about Nebuchadnezzar yet, but we're gonna no, we're no. gonna say okay, we're gonna see some some unbelievers in reversionism. But what we're talking about here, this is not unbeliever reversionism. These are believers who came out of Egypt. Everyone who came out of Egypt was a born again believer, not a Christian, but a born again believer. So now what happens in this Maribah revolution, after all this time, these born again believers are complaining against God. And so what we're trying to show is in the passage, Exodus 17, 1 through 4, mm -hmm. we're contrasting a born again believer who is reversion is reversionist as opposed to an unbeliever we're contrasting them now look at the so here are these believers they yeah. are in reversionism okay point number two reactor factors were manifested at the first meribah in exodus 17 verses one through four so here's the issue if you go back to if you go back to this passage now in 17 one through four we're going to see these Jews, they are complaining about what we talked about a little while ago. Mm -hmm. They're complaining, complaining, complaining. That's the first Mirabah. And, and what they did there, they were reacting, reaction mm -hmm. and distraction. They were reacting. And what is a manifestation of that reaction? Here it is. Especially, Especially the mental attitude, sins, delusion, discouragement and frustration absolutely this is disillusion okay disillusion That's good okay now so there are, these are manifestations of that reactor factor now what happens then reactor factors are mm -hmm. going to produce something else what are they going to produce Pro produce a frantic search for happiness which was manifested by operation golden calf okay so here's what happened in in meribah repetum and meribah they're complaining because they don't have any more water Complain, 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 complain. Well, that's one thing, but they while they're reacting, they, they're moving along, and guess what? Moses goes up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. He didn't come down fast enough, and when he finally comes down, they got this golden calf that they've made, and they're going to worship this golden calf in another way because Moses isn't coming back to them fast enough. Now, watch this. Yeah. So the reactor factors are going to produce a frantic search for happiness. Mm -hmm. He's gone. They're not happy. We've got to find something that's going to make us happy. So what do they do? It's the story of the golden calf. So read this for us, Brian. The story of the golden calf reveals human nature and the tendency of people to stray away from the devotion to God. 
While Moses was on the Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from God, the Israelites were breaking the very first commandment, thou shalt not ha have any gods before me. You see this now? He's up the mountain. And they're just... He's going up to get the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And before he comes down, they've already broken the first one. They don't even know what they're about. Mm -hmm. So they're in a frantic search for happiness. He's gone. We don't know where we all this. Oh, we need to find some kind of happiness. So what do they do? They're going to start what complaining. Is, yeah, watch what happens. Go ahead. This makes it evident why the commandments were needed as people exhibit a, a natural drift towards sin without the proper leadership and a sense of morality. morality. As the Israelites grew impatient with Moses on the Mount Sinai, they decided to make a new God to worship. So they took their gold jewelry and melted it down to build a golden calf. Yeah. God saw that his people had constructed a false idol and his replacement and planned to consume or kill all of them. But Moses uh, courage, uh, courageously requested God to relent from the disaster against your people. <laughs> so then he's up the mountain. He's gonna, he gone a little longer than they thought he should be. So they said, oh, we take... They take all their gold, the jewelry, and they melt it down. They make them a golden calf, and they're going to worship it. Yeah. God says, excuse me, just a minute here. Just a second. Yeah. He ain't got so I'm going to kill them all. Mm -hmm. God says, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to kill them all. Moses said, God, just a second now. Hold it just a second. Please, please don't. And God listened to him, and he relented, and he didn't kill him, okay? This is mercy. Yeah. So point number four. <laughs> the Maribel Revolution was a combination of reactor factors, frantic search for happiness, emotion, revolt, leading to strong negative volition, which caused blackout of the soul, hardness of the heart, which resulted in reverse process reversionism at Kadesh Barnea. Barnea. Okay, now what? So see what happens? They have now they're not they're not yet where they, they want to be. He's still leading them. And what's happened now, they get the Maribel. And they start to complain about the water, water, water. And all along the way, they're complaining, complaining, and complaining. They're moving through the stages of reversionism. They all get all the way to black, black out of the soul, hardness of the heart, which is scar tissue of the soul. And guess what? By the time they get to that point, they get the Kadesh Barnea, a location, another location. Mm -hmm. It's talked about in, in Numbers 10, verse 11, all the way through uh, chapter 14, mm -hmm. verse 45. And what happens by the time they get to Katie's Barney, he says, good grief is done. I've had enough of all this. God's saying that. So what we see that here then is move on. We're going to talk about that. It can easily be seen that Kadesh uh, was, was a major turning point for the first generation of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. They failed to trust and obey one time too many, and the consequences was beginning was being denied the blessing of possessing the land of Canaan. Yes. Did this generation loathe, mm -hmm. loathe, ma loathe manna and prefer Egypt to, Can uh, to Canaan? Canaan? Yeah. Now watch this. See, th this is interesting. See, did, uh, did this generation that came out of Egypt, okay? Yeah. They've they've done all this complaining from uh, from uh, <clears throat> from Meribah all the way down here to uh, to Kadesh Barnea. By the time they get to Kadesh Barnea, they're already in uh, scar tissue of the soul. They move through all except the last except for the last stage of reversionism. <clears throat> and it says, they, they here's the question: Did this generation loathe manna? and prefer, prefer Egypt and Canaan. They said, listen, Moses, we'd rather be back in Egypt eating onions, onions and, and garlic. And garlic. Yeah. yeah. We'd rather be back there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They said, wait a minute, just a second. So they would eat manna. Go ahead. They would eat manna for nearly 40 years, and they would wander about through the wilderness. Even though God had delivered this generation from the bondage in Egypt with a powerful hand, they they would not trust God to give them victory over the Canaanites. It was a great failure of faith. See, that's it. They, by the time, by the, from the time they came out of Egypt till the time they got to Kadesh Barnea, it was just bad, worse, 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 worser, 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 yeah. worser, okay? Till they get down, get to Kadesh Barnea, and this is it. So what was the problem all along the way? It was, it was a, a great, great failure, failure of faith. faith. That's exactly what we have in this country today. Yeah. 
it is there's a possibility we'll be complaining if the right president doesn't get <laughs> well, that's and we'll start complaining about that. that that's right but now i tell you what though i have a sneaking suspicion that he isn't going to complain that's cody mm -hmm. yeah i have a sneaking suspicion that you're not going to complain because we understand the issue mm -hmm. i'm not going to complain because i understand the issue god is going to take care of us no matter what happens yeah we may not like the way he takes care of us, but it will be for his glory, whatever it is that takes place. So all along the way, for the Jews back then in coming out of Egypt, it was a failure of faith. Guess what? In the day of Jesus, it was a failure of faith. You look today, right now, it is a failure of faith. Now, let's, let's keep on going here in the last five minutes. We should note that this sin is neither sudden nor unexpected in the book of numbers mm -hmm. israel grumbled and com and complaining began shortly after they safely passed through the red sea Absolutely. moses informs the israelites that this failure of kadesh mm -hmm. was the tenth such act of rebellion stop right there see the moses ten. informs the israelites that this failure kadesh was the tenth such act of rebellion. Mm -hmm. So from, from the time they came out of Egypt, they, they, they were rebelling against God here, they're rebelling against God there, 10 separate times mm -hmm. that God is dealing with these people where they're reacting, okay? Mm -hmm. So sin is not, not nearly as sudden, go ahead. Sin is, not, sin is not nearly as sudden and unexpected as it may at first appear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Israel had developed a pattern of grumbling and, re and rebellion. Yeah. This event was the last straw so far as God was concerned. See, that's the Kadesh Barnea. Yeah. See, he's, he, he tolerated them here and here and here and here and here. He gets to the point and says, hold it just a second. This is the last straw. This is it. Okay, so go on from there. He is gracious and long-suffering, long but there finally comes a point of no return. Please understand that that's the same here in the United States. And that's why, Brian, that's why we're talking about Ezra 9.8. Yeah. We had four years. We had four years to get this thing right. And the question is, what's going to happen in November? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you now, and I've said, listen, I'm God's mouthpiece. That's all. If you've got a problem with that, you talk to God about it. All we're doing is unfolding scripture for you. So even, even though, go ahead. Okay. Israel reached the point at Kadesh, even though they expressed sorrow and a willingness to confront the Canaanites, it was too late. See there? I mean, they, they, they got to the point where, they said, okay, no, no, God, I'm sorry. It's all, I'm gonna... He says, no, he said, it's too late. Yeah. It's too late. How about November the 4th? It may be too late. And temporary application, Brian. Let us be very careful about grumbling. <laughs> Our grumbling like that of ancient Israel is often directed towards our circumstances. See, hold it right there. See, what are your, I don't care what your circumstances is. What is it, health? Is it wealth? Is it something else? Is it job related? What is it? It's complain, 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 complain. This is a pattern. We've seen it here. Okay, go ahead. How often? How often God has provided for our needs and, uh, and how often we think that he should have done better. <laughs> yeah. We are frequently not content with his blessings and complain about our lot in life. Yeah. Our grumbling like that of the Israelites is often directed at our leaders. We fail to grasp the fact that when we grumble against our leaders, we ultimately grumble against God. Boy, please do this. Say that one more time, Brian. We we fail, we fail to grasp the fact that when we grumble against our leaders, we ultimately grumble against God. Read Exodus 16, 7, please. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your grumbling against the Lord. And what are we that you grumble against us? Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, how read number 17, 5. It will come, it will come about that the rod of the man whom I choose will sprout. Mm -hmm. Thus I will lessen, I'm sorry. lessen from upon myself the grumblings of the son of Israel who are grumbling against you. 17.10. But the Lord said to Moses, put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony 
to, to be kept as a sign against the rebels so that you may put the end to the, gru to the grumbling against me so that they will not die. Put back the rod. Wepo, wepo, wepo. Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony be kept as a sign against the rebels. Good. Uh, just two more points here. Their, those. their right land was Canaan, and because they believe the majority of the report, they said no to Canaan. <laughs> the right hand was Canaan. The right land was Canaan. Yep. And because they believed the majority of the report. See, this they sent 10 spies into Canaan. They came back. Two of them said, hey, we can whoop them over there, okay? Ten of them said, oh, eight of them said, oh, no, no, no. We can't do that. Okay? Mm -hmm. So they, but the people, the mass of people believed the majority report. And here's the result. The result was reversionistic discipline to the entire generation. And finally, after 39 years, the administration of this sin unto death. Everybody who came at us out of the Egypt who was 20 years of older, died in the wilderness. Why? They lacked the faith to get into the promised land. The promised land for you and I is spiritual maturity. Mark it down. That's the goal. That's the promised land for us. A lack of faith will keep us from getting there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now let's next Sunday we'll <laughs> next Sunday we'll pick up with Nebuchadnezzar's part. See, we're going to get a group of unbelievers now who are in reversions. We've just seen a whole series of verses about a group of believers who are in reversionism. We've seen the pattern of uh, Pharaoh. We've seen the pattern in Jesus' day of the Jews there, and we're seeing the same pattern in the United States of America today. Yeah. Cody, you want to pray for us? Yes. Do it, buddy. Come on over here. Come on up there. Come on up there. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Just get around. Boy, I just want your faith. Want your you to be able to be able to. Sit. There you go. Thank you, buddy. That's Most it. gracious heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your word tonight and encouraging us to keep on keeping on. Um, sanctify this time and uh, protect us as we go and to be bold uh, for the Lord that you may be honored and glorified. We ask these things, your Son Jesus Christ, and Amen. Amen, Amen, brother. Okay, listen, folks, we'll be back on again. This is uh, a Wednesday night with uh, with Pastor Al Rosenblum. Tomorrow, Daryl. Tomorrow, Daryl, that's right. Daryl's in uh, Branson, Missouri. And uh, Cody, it's good to have you here again tonight. God bless you. He's a regular on a Monday night home Bible study, but since COVID-19, we've not been able to do it. So uh, he works at the hospital. He's a fantastic born-again Christian. And a friend of ours, Brian, it's good to see you and have you with yeah. me tonight. Love you, son. Yeah. Okay. Too. So we'll go ahead and close this out, and uh, we'll be back on uh, Wednesday night.